Hi, everyone. So it's just about noon time here um, on the East Coast. I know for some of you joining on the West Coast, it is breakfast time for you all. So I thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are going to get started with the presentation. Um, but before we do so, just a couple of housekeeping items um, for everyone that's on the call. Um, so as most of you know, this is part two of our diabetes workshop. Um, this part two is entitled Living Well with Diabetes. Um, similarly to the first presentation, this um, series is sponsored by the Good Health Gateway Diabetes Care Rewards Program, and it's presented by Good Measure Meals. Uh, so as I had mentioned, this is the second part of a two-part series that we're offering as part of Diabetes Awareness Month, which is November. Uh, and if you missed part one of the series, uh, I will be providing the link to our YouTube channel within the comments section of the GoToWebinar platform. So that will be available to anyone that missed part one that would like to view it. Part one was really focused on the basics and management of diabetes. Um, so there's some really useful information in there for anyone that might be newly diagnosed or just would like some refresher information about um, helpful tips for diabetes management and some diabetes basics. Um, so more information is provided on that um, within the comments section. And then we'll also be providing a recorded link to this presentation today. So following the presentation, um, this is a recorded uh, series. So Part one and part two will both be available on our YouTube channel. So for anyone that has registered for um, either part one or part two of the diabetes workshop, you will be getting an email from Good Health Gateway with links to the recorded presentations if you wish to view them uh, after today. In addition, if you do have questions throughout today's presentation, uh, feel free to submit them. Um, within the questions section of the GoToWebinar platform. And if time allows at the end of the webinar, we will address a few of the questions that come in throughout the presentation. Uh, if for some reason we're running short on time, we will respond to all questions um, directly via email following the presentation. So feel free to submit those questions and we will get back to you uh, after today's presentation. All right, so before we dive into some of the content for today, I want to just take a brief moment to introduce you to our speakers that are on the call. So my name is Sarah Costa, and I am an Account and Customer Engagement Manager with the Good Health Gateway Program. I'm also joined today by Alyssa Palladino. Alyssa is a registered dietitian with Good Measure Meals, and she'll be taking us through part two of this workshop today. Before I hand the presentation over to Alyssa and we jump into living well with diabetes, I wanted to provide a brief overview of the Good Health Gateway program. The program is designed to help people manage their diabetes and earn rewards for meeting basic program requirements. Depending on your program, rewards for participating may be in the form of copay waivers or reductions on diabetes medications and supplies, cash or gift cards. The Good Health Gateway program was developed by Abacus Health Solutions, a third-party vendor that specializes in developing and administering incentive-based wellness programs. Abacus is completely responsible for the program design, promotion, as well as protecting your privacy. So you can feel confident that no personal health information is ever shared back with your employer. So participants in the Good Health Gateway program are asked to visit their doctor to complete important American Diabetes Association recommended standards of care. Um, these consist of exams such as an eye exam, a foot exam, blood work, urine tests, and A1C tests. Some of you, depending on your program, may also have to complete an annual conversation with our diabetes educator. This is to help develop a diabetes health action plan that you can share with your doctor at your next visit.
If you would like to learn more information about the Good Health Gateway program following this presentation, please visit our website at www.goodhealthgateway.com or call our helpline at 800-643-8028. You are also welcome to submit your questions through the, Good, through, through the GoToWebinar platform and we'll get back to you following the presentation. So with that being said, I am going to hand the presentation over to Alyssa from Good Measure Meals and she is going to take us through part two of this um, workshop, Living Well with Diabetes. Well, thank you for that introduction, Sarah. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Alyssa. I'm a registered dietitian with Good Measure Meals, um, and I'm going to be presenting the second part of this nutrition workshop series. Um, for those of you who tuned in the first time, um, in part one, we covered basics and management of diabetes. So we talked about what diabetes is and how, where we get it from, where does it come from. Um, we talked about the other chronic health conditions that are related to diabetes. Um, and we talked about, we started getting into how food um, and exercise impact diabetes and what the best way is for me to eat to control diabetes. So in part two, which is today, um, we're calling it living well with diabetes. I'm going to take a closer look at how to eat for best blood glucose control as well as address some hot topics in um, diabetes management. So objectives for today's presentation, we're going to spend some time recapping the lessons we learned the first time. Um, we're going to talk about how to use the food nutrition facts label as well as the plate method to make food choices that support um, blood glucose control. And then we're going to address some hot, hot, hot topics in diabetes. So specifically, we're going to look at the safety and efficacy of artificial sweeteners, um, get into the glycemic index and whether it's useful, and then address whether it is possible to reverse diabetes. So first off, our ABCs. We covered this in the first session. Um, but remember that diabetes does put us at increased risk for more than just that high blood sugar, high blood glucose. Um, so we do tend to see the increased A1C, right? That's a reflection of blood, glu blood glucose control over three months, and it's often how diabetes or prediabetes is diagnosed. Um, but it also puts us at increased risk for high blood pressure or hypertension, so that's where the B comes, to, comes from, the blood pressure, as well as high cholesterol, um, so that's where the C comes from, and specifically that high LDL cholesterol, which is a bad type and increases risk for um, cardiovascular events like heart attack and stroke. Um, and so for all three of these levels, these blood levels or cholesterol management levels, um, they can be managed with a similar lifestyle approach. So it takes balanced eating, it takes achieving and then maintaining a healthy body weight, getting regular exercise, regularly monitoring your blood glucose, um, being compliant with medications, and making sure to keep regular check-ins with your physician and whoever else is on your healthcare team. Um, we talked about exercise a lot in the first session, and I do really want to emphasize this because there are so many benefits of, of regular exercise, particularly when it comes to diabetes management, but really as far as overall health and quality of life. So exercise strengthens your heart, it strengthens your muscles and your bones. Um, it helps lower cholesterol, specifically that LDL, the bad cholesterol, and can help raise HDL, which is the healthy cholesterol. Um, it can also, ha also help lower blood pressure. Um, also, exercise acts as a natural insulin. So acutely, when we are exercising, there are physiological changes that occur that allow blood glucose to actually enter your cells and leave your blood without insulin. So you're going to see the immediate drop in blood sugar. Um, and then over time, if you're consistent with exercise, you're going to improve your insulin sensitivity. So the ability of those cells to clear your sugar from your blood. Um, and so because it acts as a natural insulin and has the effect of lower, lowering blood, sh blood sugar, it's particularly important <clears throat> to be aware of the risk for hypoglycemia, so super low blood sugar that can occur during exercise, um, and make sure you're monitoring that um, you're having carbs before you exercise and you're keeping quick carbs, so really simple sugars on hand when you're exercising for emergencies. Um, when it comes to recommendations for how much exercise to do, the general recommendation um, is 150 minutes as, as a minimum per week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise. So that's like walking, jogging, biking, dancing, anything that moderately raises your heart rate. 
Um, and ideally, we want to be doing that over at least three days per week so that we're not going more than two days without any kind of exercise. Um, and in addition to that aerobic exercise, we want to be doing two days of resistance or strength training, like weightlifting or bodyweight exercises, yoga, Pilates, um, to preserve that lean muscle mass. And also really focused on reducing sedentary time. So just as important as fitting in more physical activity is cutting down on that seated time. Um, every 90 minutes or so, you want to be getting up and moving your body. Um, and really bottom line when it comes to exercise is um, the best type is the one that you enjoy because that's the one you're going to be doing most often and consistency is key. Um, so find what you love and do it regularly. Eating for diabetes. Okay, so we did start getting into this in the first session. Specifically, we talked about carbs and how they impact blood sugar um, and really the types of carbs that we want to be focusing on, one for overall health, but two for that better um, regulation of blood sugar. So we do want to focus on fiber-rich, nutrient-dense carbs and minimize um, the added sugars and the kind of refined carbs. So eating our, choosing a whole grain over a white grain, eating whole fruit over fruit juice, and getting plenty of vegetables. Um, but beyond that, and we will delve a little bit into more into carbs today, beyond that, there are a ton of myths out there about how people should be eating for diabetes. And I want to take a minute um, to kind of dispel some of those. So the first myth is that people with diabetes should only eat special diabetic foods. Um, and that's actually like by the food industry, it's, they're capitalizing on that. And they do certainly, you'll see in the grocery store and actually the, um, the drug store as well, sections with foods that are specifically targeted to people with diabetes. Um, and like all, you know, food company marketing, it's, you know, the goal is, is profit. Um, and it's perpetuating a myth because in fact, a healthy meal plan for people with diabetes is pretty much the same as a healthy meal plan for anybody. Um, I'm going to counsel someone who comes to me with for diabetes management very similarly to how I would counsel somebody who is actively trying to lose weight, manage weight, lower blood sugar, uh, lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, or just generally have a healthy balanced eating plan. Um, you might need to be a, a bit more cautious um, to sticking to the recommendations, but the recommendations themselves are quite similar. All right, the other myth that I hear often um, is that if you have diabetes, you cannot eat carbs, no carbs at all. And that is also a myth. Um, as we talked about in the first session, carbs are an essential source of energy for our brains and our muscles. Um, we really do need to be consuming them for optimal health and, and functioning. Um, so they're really important, but the type matters and the portion portions matter, especially when it comes to blood sugar control. And we're gonna, we dress type, a bit in the first session, we're gonna get into the portions a little bit more today. But absolutely, you should be eating carbs. Um, and then the final myth is that people with diabetes cannot eat any sweets or chocolate. And I'm happy to share with you today that that is definitely not the case. You can enjoy desserts as a part of a healthy meal plan in moderation and counting them if they do contain sugar, which is a carbohydrate, um, counting them towards, towards the carbs that are built into your, your diabetes management plan. All right. So we're going to get into some more ways that you can um, plan your nutrition intake to help manage your blood sugar and manage your diabetes. Um, we talked about how carbohydrates are, of the three macronutrients, the ones that are going to raise your blood sugar, right? So they're going to be digested, absorbed, converted into sugar, raise your blood sugar, um, and then because our insulin isn't working as well um, as somebody without diabetes, our blood sugar may stay high. Um, typically, insulin is going to work to help lower that um, by allowing the blood sugar to enter the cells and clear your blood. So we do want to, because carbs affect our blood sugar, we do want to be mindful about um, not only the types we're eating, but how many we're eating and how much of carb-rich foods we're eating. Um, the American Diabetes Association recommends being consistent with carb intakes for consistent blood sugar control. Um, and so what that really means is that at each of your meals and snacks, you want to have a pretty steady amount of carbs um, that's similar at each of those meals and snack times versus having one meal where you're taking in a ton of carbs and another meal that you're having virtually none. Um, that's a surefire way to send your blood sugar into into haywire. Um, so that consistent carb intake is really key. And that takes some planning ahead. Uh, it also takes understanding 
which foods contain carbs and how many carbs those foods contain. Um, and so one method of staying on top of that and doing that planning is through something called exchanges. Um, the goal of exchanges is to make it a little bit easier to stay consistent with your carb intake. Um, and it's a, essentially grouping foods with similar amounts of carbohydrates. Um, and the next slide will illustrate that a little bit more. Um, but one exchange is defined by the portion that provides 15 grams of carbohydrates. Okay, so we're going to illustrate that on the next slide here. So as you can see, this is a list of foods that contain carbohydrates. Um, and what it's showing here is the portion size of that food that provides approximately one exchange or 15 grams of carbs. So a small piece of fruit is a great example. Um, unfortunately, most of the fruit that you will find in the grocery store now is two or three times this size. Um, so, But think about the apples that come in the bag that look like they're snack size, that they're made for children. Um, they're about the size of a baseball. That's a small apple, and that does contain approximately 15 grams of carbs. The larger apples that you're going to tend to see in the grocery store, if you actually weighed them on a scale, um, you'd see that they were probably more like eight ounces, not four ounces here. And, and because it's double the amount, it has more like 30 grams of carbs instead of 15 grams of carbs, which doesn't mean you can't eat it, but you just have to kind of know that and account for that. Um, so some other carb-rich foods, what portion size of those foods provide one exchange or 15 grams of carbs, a cup of milk, a half a cup of juice, a third of a cup of cooked pasta or rice, a half a cup of most starchy vegetables, so that include your green peas, pinto or kidney beans, um, mashed potatoes. It also um, is about half a cup of sweet potatoes, so for your starchy vegetables, about half a cup. Um, it's a tablespoon of jam or jelly. I'm just kind of reading out some of these. Obviously, you can read them for yourself, too. A half a cup of cooked cereal, which is oatmeal, about three-quarters of a cup of most ready-to-eat unsweetened cereal. Um, and you can even see there's things on here like cake. There's things on here like potato chips. So going back to the idea that diabetics or people with diabetes cannot ever eat sweets, you can. You just have to know how many carbs are in, are in that and account for it. Um, so you'll have access to this. You can kind of refer back to it. One thing I like to point out is with popcorn, um, three cups of popcorn is only providing you with one exchange or 15 grams of carbs. So because so much air is incorporated into it, you get a lot more volume for the same amount of carbs. So that's a great snack if you're looking for some volume snacking as opposed to only like nine or um, potato chips. Okay, so how many exchanges do I need? That's going to differ for everybody. Um, and if you do want some individualized support figuring that out for yourself, definitely see if you can make an appointment with a registered dietitian um, or a certified diabetes educator, um, which you do have access to through this program. Um, if you're looking specifically for a dietitian, there's a link there where you can find, um, find a dietitian that's local to you through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the agency that oversees um, registered dietitians um, and regulatory compliance. Um, but your exchanges are gonna depend really on um, your calorie needs, which depend on your age, your gender, your height, your weight, and your activity level. So there's really not gonna be one size fits all approach. Um, if you want some guidelines to get started, the American Diabetes Association typically recommends three to four exchanges for your meals, which would translate into 45 to 60 grams of carbs per meal, and one to two exchanges for snacks, um, which would be 30 to, uh, 15 to 30 grams. Um, so that could look like one of those, one small apple or even one big apple, for example. And if you paired that with a, something with protein or fat that didn't provide any carbs, like an egg, um, that could be a nice balanced snack for you. All right, but again, that's very individualized. So if you are trying to use carbohydrate counting as a way to um, make sure you're consistent with your carb intake throughout the day, you're going to have to know how many carbs are in the foods that you're eating based on how much of that food you're eating. And so if you're eating a food that comes with a food label that's going to have a nutrition facts panel on it, um, you can use the numbers and information that that provides to help you make your choices that support your goals. Um, the, the key thing to notice on the Nutrition Facts panel, and this is across the board, no matter what reason you're looking at it for, um, is the serving size. Because um, everything on that label is only accurate as to what you're taking in if you're consuming that serving size. So if you're eating less than that, 
or you're eating more than that, and you may you may want to or you may need to, everything on that label then needs to be divided or multiplied accordingly to accurately accurately reflect what you're taking in. So with this food, and I don't honestly know what it is, um, but it's for the serving size is one cup, um, and so you can see the total carbohydrates in one cup of this food is 25 grams. So if you were eating two cups of this food, you'd be getting 50 grams of carbs. If you're eating half a cup of this food, you'd be getting 12 and a half grams of carbs. So uh, that sounds kind of like common knowledge, but I don't know how many times, I can't tell you how many times, you know, this has been a point of confusion um, for people who are trying to track their intake or, or use a food label to, to plan their intake. Um, so this product does provide 25 grams of carbs, which is, remember, an exchange is 15 grams. So this is almost two exchanges. Um, worth of carbs. So it's it's a contributor. Um, but note too, there's eight eight grams of that of that carb is fiber. I mean if you recall from the first session, we talked about how fiber is the slows down digestion and slows down how um, rapidly eating carbs raises blood sugar. So choosing a food like this where eight of those grams of carbohydrates are fi are fiber is really a great choice for diabetes management. Um, adding to that the fact that there's 15 grams of protein in this product in one serving, um, another factor that's going to slow down digestion and slow down the impact of these carbs on your blood sugar. So I, don't, again, don't have any idea what this food is, but I would say that it's, as far as being a balanced um, food choice for your blood sugar control, it, it would definitely fit the bill um, because of that fiber and that protein there. Um, so... The other thing to look, there's a lot of obviously numbers on here. Um, so carbs are going to be important if you're planning your carbs um, and trying to track them. You also want to look at calories. Um, instead of counting calories, I often recommend people focus on making their calories count. So choosing foods that are more nutrient dense and offering more nutritional bang for your buck um, versus foods that are giving a lot of quote unquote empty calories. So lots of calories, little nutrition. Um, but overall for weight management, which is an important part of diabetes management, um, calories do matter, um, and so this product, as you can see, has 230 calories in the one cup serving. Um, the other things that you might want to take a look at on here, specifically when it comes to managing cholesterol and blood pressure, are the saturated fat and the sodium. So the saturated fat in this product is 3.5 grams, which isn't terrible. It's not a ton. Um, for cardiovascular health, we recommend keeping saturated fat intake to no more than 10% of our daily calories. So depending on your calorie needs, I don't know, the 3.5 grams may be a lot or maybe not so bad. Um, but specifically when it comes to heart health, too much saturated fat can raise our LDL cholesterol. Remember, that's the bad one. Um, so we want to keep tabs on that. And so reading the food label and looking for that is key. Um, and then sodium. So if you are, if you have high blood pressure, if you're looking to lower high blood pressure, better manage it. Looking at the sodium in, in products is really, really important. Um, sodium has a direct impact on how much fluid we retain, and that can then impact blood pressure significantly. Um, we generally recommend less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium for the whole day. And interestingly, it's not the salt shaker where most Americans consume their salt. It's, um, it's for through processed foods and foods just like this that have a food label. So you can see 870 milligrams in just one cup is actually pretty significant given that we want to be keeping our daily intake to less than 2,300 milligrams. So there's some changes coming to the food label. Some um, food companies have already started using it. Um, it's going to specify added sugars versus naturally occurring sugars. It's going to make the serving size more obvious, and there's going to be some different nutrients at the bottom that are pointed out. Instead of vitamin A and vitamin C, it's going to be pointing out vitamin D and potassium. Um, so look for those changes if you haven't seen them already. Another tool for helping um, make your meals balanced as far as your carbs and also the other nutrients that you need without necessarily having to um, weigh or measure foods or really read food labels is to use the plate method. And I actually love the plate method as a, a nutrition strategy, and I use it with clients whether they're looking to manage diabetes, whether they're looking to lose weight, or whether they're just trying to eat more healthy because it really does enable you to create a balanced meal in any setting and incorporate your favorite food. So to start, you're going to fill half your plate with salad or non-starchy vegetables, um, which are really any of your vegetables besides potatoes, peas, and corn. Um, these foods are naturally high in water, high in fiber, and you're going to get a lot of volume and nutrition with very few carbs and very few calories. So you're going to fill half your plate up with those. 
Um, the next quarter of your plate is going to be a lean protein source. Um, so that could be your skinless chicken or turkey. It could be um, seafood or fish. It could be some lean beef. Um, it could be eggs, tofu, dairy products. Um, if you're a vegetarian, you can include your beans and lentils in that portion too, although they're going to also up the carb, the carb um, count for that meal. Just note that. And then the final quarter of your plate, you're going to fill with um, your, your carbs, essentially. So your whole grains, ideally, and your starchy vegetables. So this is where your brown rice, your quinoa, your bread, um, your potatoes, your corn. And if you aren't a vegetarian, I would probably recommend counting your, your beans and um, legumes in this category as well, since they are starchy. Um, and then finally, you'll see at the top, there's um, you've got your fruit and you've got your milk or your dairy. You do not have to include fruit and milk um, with every meal. If you want to kind of save those food groups for snacks, I think that's a great approach. Um, both fruit and milk are um, sources of natural sugars, so um, carbohydrates, but also a lot of other nutri nutrition as well. So your fiber and your vitamins and minerals, protein in the case of dairy. Um, and there's a great tool on the American Diabetes Association website where you can actually customize your own healthy eating for diabetes plate um, with your favorite food. So you'll see options to swap in different kinds of vegetables, starches, proteins, fruits, and dairy. Um, it's really cool. And again, this I didn't mention this, but this works for a nine-inch plate. Um, so it doesn't necessarily work um, to control your carb intake or your calorie intake if you're using a giant plate. So just keep that in mind. But yeah, check this website out. It's definitely um, fun to play around with. And you can see how all foods really can fit. Um, when it comes to building a balanced meal and managing blood sugar, there's no foods that are off limits as long as you balance them out with the other components. Okay, so now we've covered some um, nutrition recommendations, really the biggest way that you can control your blood sugar and manage your diabetes is through your food choices. So I hope that you found that section um, illuminating. There's a lot more to be said on that topic. But I also want to address some, I guess, more controversial topics that you will um, really hear about when it comes to diabetes. Um, and so we're going to start with sugar. So sugar has gotten a really, really bad rep um, in the past few years. It's a really hot topic in the media, and not just when it comes to diabetes, but really everybody seems to be um, believing that they're addicted to sugar, that they need to go on a detox from sugar. It's being blamed for all sorts of chronic health conditions from obesity to diabetes to heart disease to cancer. Um, and for sure, Americans do overconsume it. Um, there's even been claims that it's as addictive as drugs. Um, and then you'll also see, on the flip side, tons of sugar-free products available. And these pictures show you just one example of the sugar-free chocolate. So we're going to delve into this a bit. And um, we know that eating sugar doesn't cause diabetes, right? We address that in the first session, um, there's a host of factors that really contribute all together to whether somebody develops diabetes. Genetics does play a role. And then really a lot of different lifestyle factors from your weight to your activity level to your food choices. Um, but sugar itself is not the cause. Okay. All right. So like I mentioned, Americans do consume a lot of sugar um, and specifically a lot of added sugar. So not necessarily the sugar that's naturally occurring in fruits and vegetables and dairy, but sugar that's really primarily found in processed snack foods and baked goods and sugary beverages. Um, the American, the, the, the government and also other health organizations have set guidelines, sort of caps on how much added sugar we should be eating. The U.S. Dietary Guidelines is actually the most liberal, lenient as far as the recommendation, and they recommend more no more than 10% of daily calories come from added sugars. So again, this doesn't count from fruit or dairy, which naturally, ha naturally has fructose and um, lactose, which for somebody on a 2,000-calorie diet, just to throw out a general um, amount, that translates into 50 grams of, car of added sugars per day. Um, but as you can see from this graph, most Americans are consuming far more than that recommended limit um, across all age groups, particularly children, which is sad to see. Um, but yeah, we are consuming far more foods with added sugars than um, we should be for health. Um, and the sources of those added sugars, beverages are the biggest contributor. And this 
is not looking at milk or 100% fruit juice, although I want to point out here that 100% fruit juice affects your blood sugar the exact same way as soft drinks, fruit drinks, or sports and energy drinks. But for this research, they weren't looking at that. Um, even without including 100% fruit juice, sugar-sweetened beverages um, accounted for a huge proportion of the added sugars that Americans are taking in. So if you're looking to make one change to your intake to better manage your diabetes and promote your health, try cutting those out or at least limiting them. Um, another major contributor of added sugars are snacks and sweets. As you can see, they're 31%. All right, so one approach you might take or consider taking if you're trying to cut down on the sugar is non-nutritive sweeteners. Um, what are they exactly? So they are um, sweeteners that provide sweetness, so that taste with few to no calories um, because they contain few to no grams of actual sugar. Um, and so there's a couple different types. So we've got our artificial sweeteners, saccharin, aspartame, and sucralose. Those are chemically made in a lab. Um, you probably know them by their names, Sweet and Low, Equal, and Splenda. Um, we're going to get into the each of these in a minute. There's also Stevia, which is quote-unquote more natural as it comes from a plant. And again, it's going to provide that sweet taste without any actual sugar. And then we've got our sugar alcohols. So if you're reading a food label, the ingredients list, and you see things that end in all, so xylitol, sorbitol, erythritol, that's a sugar alcohol. It's less sweet than regular sugar. Um, the body does absorb about half of sugar alcohols that are listed on a label. So it can have a mild impact potentially for over-consuming it on blood sugar. It's not going to completely be, have, have no impact the way that, in theory, an artificial sweetener or stevia would. Um, but because you're only absorbing half of the sugar alcohols, the rest of them are going undigested, unabsorbed from your small intestines into your colon. Um, where bacteria can ferment them. So if you are over-consuming foods with lots of sugar alcohols, um, whatever your aim is, whether it's to you know lose weight or limit uh, regulate blood sugar, what you may experience is some bloating and some gas and some diarrhea as a result of that unabsorbed, those unabsorbed sugar alcohols. So definitely be mindful of that. You'll find them in lots and lots of um, foods, including in sugar-free gum, but a lot of times sugar-free products, if you do look at the ingredients label, you'll see at least some of these sugar alcohols. Okay, so I mentioned these earlier, but some of the more common non-nutritive sweeteners that you're probably familiar with are saccharin, which is the um, under the brand Sweet and Low. Anytime you see a pink packet, it's made with saccharin, two to two hundred to seven hundred times sweeter than sugar, um, but the carb content is, content is less than one gram for each packet. Um, equal, which is the brand name for aspartame or any blue packet you see, is two hundred times sweeter than sugar and it contains less than one gram of carbs or sugar per blue packet. Um, Splenda has the compound sucralose, so any kind of yellow packet typically will have that as the um, artificial sweetener. It's 600 times sweeter than sugar, and there's less than one gram of carbs per each packet. And then finally, the most common or one of the more common ways of finding stevia in the market is through a product called Truvia. Um, or Pure Vita is another one, too. And these are actually combinations of stevia and one of the sugar alcohols, erythritol. Um, these packets are two to 300 times sweeter than sugar and contain 1.5 grams of carbs per packet. Um, you can find also just pure stevia. I think the companies like Truvia and Pure Vita cut it with a sugar alcohol um, just for the taste because pure stevia has a bit of an aftertaste. Um, okay, so we know that these are products that provide sweet taste without any calories or sugar, um, but are they actually safe? So that's been really controversial, and there's been a lot of back and forth over that. Um, some of the claims have been made regarding cancer and heart disease, but honestly, very few of these studies were performed on humans. Um, the rats that were used in the studies were being fed multiple times their body weight in sweeteners. So imagine if we were consuming multiple times in our body weight of sweeteners. There's no way we would ever consume that much. Um, and so those rats potentially did see some, some side effects. But again, there's no way we could ever replicate that in humans in a realistic way. Um, thereby, the risks that we're seeing are, are probably not applicable. Um, and also keep in mind, like with all like health and nutrition studies, only some of them make the news and only the ones that are sensational really do. So there may have been tons of studies and there have been tons of studies that confirm the safety of artificial sweeteners, 
that nobody really ever hears about because they're boring. Um, so, so yeah, always take what you read in, in the media and the way nutrition research is translated by the media with a grain of salt or multiple grains of salt. Um, so just to review some of this, the research that had come out um, with saccharin, in the 1970s, there was a study, one study, that showed bladder cancer in rats, um, but again, with those really, really high levels of, of, of saccharin, um, and no researcher has been able to show the same mechanism, mechanistic action in humans. Um, sucralose, so before it was approved in 1998, there were hundreds of studies that showed it was safe, so no evidence of human harm. Um, rats showed some enlarged thymus and spleen, so some organs, but they were consuming the equivalent of 150 pound human adult consuming 74 to 495 pounds of the, sub the sugar substitute. So again, we're not gonna be doing that. Um, and then with aspartame, rats were fed the equivalent of an adult drinking eight to 2,000 cans of soda daily. Um, and even so, it was inconsistent as far as the findings that um, that intake led to higher rates of leukemia and lymphoma. Um, so that said, the Food and Drug Administration has set acceptable daily limits, intake limits, like levels um, of what is considered safe. And these levels are far lower than the intake that level that's actually been proven safe. So it's an abundance and abundance of caution. Um, and even so, these levels, and you can see them on the left here, are really far more than I would say any reasonable person would um, probably consume. So for saccharin, the acceptable daily intake level is set at five milligrams per kilogram of body weight, which translates into nine packets per day for an 150 pound person. Um, for sucralose, again, it's that five milligrams per kilogram of body weight, which translates into 31 packets per day for somebody who weighs 165 pounds. Um, with aspartame, 50 milligrams of kilo per kilogram of body weight, which translates into 20 cans of diet soda per day for an 150 pound person. Um, aspartame is typically the artificial sweetener you'll find in diet soda. Um, and then with stevia, the, the acceptable daily intake level is four milligrams per kilogram of body weight, which is um, the equivalent of 30 packets per day for a 150 pound person. And again, these are acceptable upper limits for safety, but they're far below the levels that research shows is actual safe. So super, super um, cautious there with the recommendations. Um, so by and large, they are safe as long as you're consuming them in moderation. Um, but are they actually beneficial? So that's the real, the real question. Um, should you be using them? Um, some research says, yes, they can um, help with weight loss and they can help with blood glucose control. And just from a mechanism of action standpoint, that does make sense as far as these sweeteners do not provide any calories. So if you are replacing something that did have calories with something that doesn't have calories, you're gonna potentially lose weight. That's a um, kind of a mechanism of action that would promote weight loss. On the same token, if you're replacing something that did have sugar with something that doesn't have sugar, um, it's gonna help manage blood glucose, right? Because the sugar would have raised your blood sugar, your blood glucose, the artificial sweetener does not. And this is assuming that you're not overcompensating somewhere else. You're not choosing the Diet Coke over the regular Coke, but then having some candy, right? That would kind of offset um, whatever benefit or beneficial effect you'd have of, of choosing the artificial sweetener. There's also been some research um, that shows the opposite, that they're not beneficial. Um, really, that those studies, um, by and large, are showing correlation and not causation. So what do I mean by that? So in a study that may find that um, artificial sweeteners are associated with higher BMI, body mass index. So basically may find that artificial sweetener use is associated with higher body weight, okay? We're not saying, those studies are not saying artificial sweeteners are the cause of that higher body weight. What it's saying is people at a higher body weight possibly are tending to use artificial sweeteners more often. Right, so we don't really know that there's any causal effect, just that they're related. Um, so I wouldn't put too much really faith in that research um, as far as it does not suggest the lack of efficacy there. Um, there's still a lot of questions that remain with the research. 
um, as far as whether non-nutritive sweeteners can change your sweetness threshold. This is a really interesting area to explore. Um, there is evidence that, you know, if you're regularly using these super, super concentrated sor um, sources of sweetness, it does. It changes the threshold that you perceive sweet. So maybe you're no longer satisfied by the natural sweetness that you'd get from eating a piece of fruit or a roasted vegetable, um, and your threshold for, for sweetness is so, so high. Um, so that's definitely a disadvantage of regularly using high amounts of, of non-nutritive sweeteners. Um, and then also some evidence, and this needs to be explored in more detail, of a phantom high blood glucose and high or insulin levels seen with artificial sweetener use. So in theory, there should be no rise in blood glucose and no insulin response since there's no sugar. Um, but there have been reports, uh, anecdotally, I guess, um, that people do experience these highs. So that may have to do with like how taste receptors um, or receptors in the stomach interact in ways that we don't fully understand at this point. Um, but based on our current understanding of how sugar affects blood sugar and how artificial sweeteners affect blood sugar, this shouldn't happen. Um, so it's definitely um, an area for further research. Um, so really the takeaway is that artificial sweeteners are not health foods, okay? So if a, your sugar-free chocolate is absolutely not a health food and it's not better for you in any way than eating fruit or eating vegetables or eating, you know, whole nutritious foods. Um, but if you're choosing artificial sweeteners to replace sources of added sugars um, or other less healthy options, they may be a beneficial part of your diabetes management plan. So if you know you're somebody who regularly pours in like four or five packs of sugar into your coffee or you're drinking cans and cans of Coke um, or other sodas, um, or sugar sweetened beverages during the day, and you want to start replacing some of that with um, an artificial sweetener or a diet soda, you are most likely going to see a benefit to your blood glucose control and your weight, assuming you're not overcompensating somewhere else. Um, regardless of whether you're using sugar or sugar substitute, do them in moderation. Always, always moderation. Um, and if you're wary of artificial sweeteners and you prefer to just be more natural, 100%, I would support that. Um, it can only be beneficial to focus on reducing that sweetness threshold and the amount of that sweet taste that you need. So relying on um, naturally sweet foods like fruit is a great example, but also like I mentioned, when you roast a vegetable, um, it caramelizes the natural sugars that are in that vegetable. So it's gonna make it taste sweeter. Um, you're not gonna appreciate that as much if you're taking in a lot of foods with either added sugars or artificial sweeteners. Um, wh again, whether you're choosing sugar, a nutritive sweetener, or artificial, a non-nutritive sweetener, use them occasionally and in small amounts, or work towards that. Again, start where you are and start kind of gradually progressing to that being more occasional or, or smaller amounts. All right. So the next hot topic is the glycemic index. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this term yet. Um, it was developed in the early 1980s as a way to classify foods that contain carbs. And essentially, it's measuring how quickly your blood glucose rises after eating foods that contain carbs compared to the same amount of carbs from either pure glucose or white bread. So glucose or white bread is given a glycemic index of 100, and then other foods are ranked accordingly by looking at that rise in blood glucose. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing. Um, you see on the right side there um, how the how different foods, carb-containing foods, are categorized based on their glycemic index. Um, at the top there are the higher ones, so in, in theory these are raising your blood glucose more rapidly um, than the ones at the bottom, which are raising your blood glucose much more slowly. Um, the ones at the bottom are foods that either have a lot of fiber in them um, or don't really have a lot of carbs. Um, so lettuce, mushrooms, cabbage, tomatoes, eggplant, broccoli, so a lot of your non-starchy vegetables, as well as hummus and chickpeas, which actually have a lot of fiber. They also have a lot of protein, right? Um, so we talked about how that impacts the effect on blood glucose. Um, and then kind of in between, you have a bunch of other foods. Um, so you've got barley and lentils, dark chocolate, milk, nuts, um, and you're sort of low to moderate, 10 to 30 on the glycemic index. In the middle there, you have some fruit, some milk, some yogurt, some oats, um, and some whole grain bread there. Um, and then at the top, kind of paired with 
where your white bread goes, you see some foods that may confuse you. So you see watermelon up there um, and you see potatoes up there, right? Um, so I guess what I want to bring your attention to with the glycemic index is that in one sense, yes, it categorizes foods that with carbs based on how they affect your blood glucose. Um, but it also can be a little bit misleading as far as which choices of foods with carbs are the best for you. Um, and so I want to talk about some of the pros and then some of the cons of the glycemic index. Um, the pro really is that it does give you a way, in theory, to compare the effect that different foods with carbs have on your blood glucose, if it worked, okay? Um, and most of our lower glycemic index foods are things we should be gravitating towards anyway, right? So our vegetables, our fruits, our whole grains, our beans and legumes. That said, there are a lot of reasons why I would not um, solely rely on the glycemic index to make your your food choices or specifically your carbohydrate choices. Um, the big thing here is that it doesn't account for the typical portion size that you've been, you'd be eating of these foods. Um, so it's comparing it to a hundred grams of that of car. It, it's the, the the portion sizes that contain a hundred grams of carbs. You may never eat of a typical food. So to eat a hundred grams worth of carrot or watermelon um, or potatoes, even would be far more than you probably would eat in a given sitting. Um, so you want to kind of take that into account because you're if you're eating much less of that food. Um, and it's a it's a nutritious fiber rich food. You should include it and not be scared of it just because it has a high GI GI index. And the watermelon is a really good example of that. I'm going to discuss glycemic load on the next slides. I know this is really complicated, um, but yes, it does not account for the typical portion size that people commonly consume of these carb foods. It doesn't also account for individual variation. So actually, this is super interesting, but different people can eat the same exact food and have a different blood sugar response. Um, and within a given person, there can be a different response in blood sugar um, based on day to day or time of day. So you could eat, you know, your apple one day and see your blood sugar go up by 30 points. And you could eat that same apple later in the day or the next day and have a, have a different effect. So there really is a lot of variation that the glycemic index doesn't take into account. Um, also, the ripeness of a food of vegetable or fruit and specifically different varieties um, of apples, of squash, et cetera, um, how it's cooked. So whether it's raw, whether it's boiled, whether it's roasted, whether it's grilled, and how it's processed. Um, so potentially like a canned fruit or a dried fruit or um, look at now that the, the, I don't know what they're, the, the dried, they're not dried, but they're anyway, dehydrated, dehydrated fruit. Um, all these do affect um, the way that the carbs in those foods impact blood sugar, making the glycemic index just not reliable. Um, and then finally, this is really important because we talked about pairing carbohydrates with the other macronutrients, building a balanced plate, using the plate method, right? So we're eating a carb, we're eating a protein. When we eat carbs with either fat or protein, it's going to have a different impact on our blood glucose than if we just ate that carb on its own. So if we're eating anything on this chart here, with any uh, anything else, we're having an apple with a string cheese, we're having um, a banana with some turkey bacon, we're having watermelon with a cup of Greek yogurt, that food is no longer going to have the same impact that the glycemic index, index predicts. So keep that in mind since we're really rarely eating those foods in isolation. Um, there's another number similarly confusing called the glycemic load um, that takes into account not only the amount, not only a how fast the blood, their blood sugar rises in response to eating a carb, but how many carbs are actually in what we would typically eat, so in a more common serving of a given food. Um, so basically, we're taking the glycemic index and we're multiplying it by the grams of carbs in the serving of that food and dividing it by 100. If it comes out to less than 10, it's considered a low glycemic load. If it comes out to more than 20, it's considered high. So just to give the example of the watermelon, it has a very high glycemic index. And as a result, I often get people asking me whether they should avoid watermelon. Um, it has a glycemic index of 80, right? Um, but when we take into account the grams of carbs in a serving of watermelon that someone would typically eat, we see that it actually only has a glycemic load of 5, which is low. So that's um, a little bit of a better 
better number to go by if you are looking for a number. Um, final topic of controversy or hot topic is whether you can reverse your diabetes. Um, and with type 1, really the answer until um, we're able to implement, you know, new pancreases into people, which the mo modern technology is, we're working in that direction. Um, but for type 1, the answer is really no, because what's happening is the pancreas's beta cells, which are the cells that produce insulin, are destroyed. We think it's an autoimmune, but we don't really know. Um, as a result, there's no insulin production, and that's irreversible. So you do will be having to supplement um, exogenous insulin to make up for that. Um, and with type 2, whether you can reverse it, it's it's a maybe. We don't have a cut and clear answer to that because it really depends on what you mean by reverse. So with type 2 diabetes, your insulin production um, is insufficient and or your cells become resistant to that insulin. Um, we know that lifestyle changes, right? So food choices, exercise habits, weight management can improve outcomes um, to the point where, depending on your definition of reverse, we may be considered reversed. So let's look at that. Um, there is no one accepted definition. There's a variety of different theories. So one theory is reversal occurs when people can go off their medications, but they still must engage in a lifestyle program in order to stay off those medications. So that is according to Ann Albright, the Director of Diabetes Translation at the CDC. So you're no longer on medications, but you have to actively keep up with your healthy diet, your exercise, um, and maintaining that healthy body weight in order to stay off their meds. Um, another definition is that reversal occurs when blood glucose and A1C returns to normal healthy levels, but people may still have higher than level normal um, insulin levels. And then a third definition is that a reversal occurs when blood glucose and insulin production return to normal levels. Um, so not just the blood glucose, but the insulin as well. Um, the trouble with that is that we really don't have established normal insulin levels, so it's difficult to really determine. Um, I think bottom line with the reversal is that regardless of whether you want to classify yourself as reversed or not, you're always going to be kind of needing to stay on top of those lifestyle um, those lifestyle habits that we know are so important to managing it. So you've got, you're going to want to stay on top of your food choices, your exercise habits, your weight. Um, and if you do that, you may, and your blood sugar and your A1C are, are back into normal ranges, you could consider yourself reversed. Um, the longer, unfortunately, you go without taking control of this, and if you, you may experience some of those longer-term complications like the neuropathy and the nerve damage, um, that may not be reversible. So um, it really is still kind of to be determined. Um, most doctors would say, and the American Diabetes Association would say that there's no cure. Um, it can be treated, it can be managed, and it can go into remission. Again, once you're in remission, you're still at increased risk. So you really that lifestyle management, all those lifestyle factors are going to be your keys for long-term success. So that's why it's so important to be in a program like this um, where you have access to that support and you can implement those healthy habits now um, and, and make them habits so that you can, you can get to that point where um, you can consider yourself in remission. Um, prolonged remission, if you're able to get to that point where A1C and blood glucose are back into the normal ranges for over five years. Um, again, as long as you're on, you're stay consistent with those lifestyle factors, um, you, you may you may be able to achieve this, which is great. Um, so just to recap what we talked about today, are sugar-free choices better? Maybe. Um, they're certainly safe in moderation, but they're not necessary by any means to manage diabetes. And um, if you overcompensate, they're not going to have the effect that you're intending them to have. Um, should you use the glycemic index to choose foods? Again, maybe. Um, it's not It's not a panacea, absolutely. It can be misleading with certain foods, but in general, it does tend to promote the foods that we know are going to be more nutritious and have less of an impact on blood sugar that we want to be steering towards anyway, and whether you can reverse your diabetes, again, maybe. So all these hot topics um, are really, there's no cut and clear answer here. Um, it's and, and like most things, it's, it's a complex issue, so it has a complex um, answer. <laughs> so yeah, maybe to all our hot topics from today. And the takeaway, um, and really I want to leave you on a note of empowerment, um, 
it is up to you and you can successfully manage diabetes, hopefully using some of the tools that we covered in both parts of this workshop, making smart food choices, being consistent with your carbs throughout the day, choosing those fiber-rich carbohydrates, limiting the added sugars, moving your body more, sitting less, achieving and then maintaining a healthy weight, and really knowing your numbers, so staying on top of those ABCs by checking in regularly with your doctor and making sure not just your A1C, but also your blood pressure and your blood cholesterol. Stay in those healthy ranges so that you can be your healthiest self. Thank you um, for your attention today. Uh, we only have a couple more minutes, but if you do want to learn more about the Good Health Gateway program, you've got their website or their phone numbers here. Um, and if you are local to the Atlanta area and you're interested in more information about Good Measure Meals, you can visit our website there. Thank you, Alyssa. So I think uh, we are coming up on the hour, but I think we do have a time for a couple of quick questions. So I'll um, pass those over to you. So one that came in um, from one of our participants um, asks, when my doctor measures my cholesterol, he notes high triglycerides all the time. Mm -hmm. what, is, what does that actually mean? So that's a really good question. Um, we talked about high triglycerides a bit in the first presentation. They're a type of fat that's in your blood. And like the cholesterol, they can be high um, in people with diabetes because when you're not able to use glucose as an energy source, your body actually has to rely on fat. Um, it's, so basically, it's fat in your blood. There is a healthy range that we want it to be less than 150. Um, the, the nutrition, from a nutrition standpoint, what you can do to lower your triglycerides is very similar to what you would do to lower blood sugar, which is really limiting sugar-sweetened beverages and foods that are like concentrated sources of sugar. So really cut out or limit your, your sodas, your soft drinks, your sweetened beverages, your processed snack food, your cookies, your pastries, things like that. Really have those in moderation um, and make sure you're pairing your carbohydrate foods with foods with protein and fat so that you don't see those blood sugar spikes, but those same strategies are going to help lower the triglycerides, um, and so will exercise. Great. Thank you. All right. So we'll do one more before we wrap up. Um, we had one other question come in um, regarding artificial sweeteners mm -hmm. um, and pregnancy. So is it safe for someone with gestational diabetes to mm -hmm. um, use artificial sweeteners as part of their diet? I mean... I, like with anything, you want to be more careful during pregnancy. So, yeah, if you have gestational diabetes, I'd probably steer clear just with an abundance of caution of artificial sweeteners or at least use them in super, super moderation the same way as you would do with caffeine and alcohol. Um, it's You know, it's going to – everything you would say is okay for somebody who's not pregnant you need to be more careful with. Um, when you are pregnant. So yeah, either don't use them or use them really, really limited amounts. Great, thank you. All right, so we are at um, 12.59 Eastern time here, so we're just coming up on the hour. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for attending to today's presentation and thank you to Alyssa for walking us through part two of the series. Uh, as I had mentioned, we will be providing links to a recording of not only part two of the webinar series, but also part one. Uh, so anyone that has signed up for either part one or part two, you will be receiving that information following today's presentation. Um, additionally, if you would like copies of the slides, um, just the slides, we're happy to provide those as well. Um, so certainly reach out to um, the email address that's on file with GoToWebinar, that's scosta Abacus Health. Uh, and we can get you that information. Uh, but that's about all for today's presentation. We hope you enjoyed uh, some of the information that we shared with you and want to wish you all uh, a great remainder of your day. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>